welcome to the afternoon session. I get to kick off just as you all fit, uh, slip into food comas, so that's fantastic. Um, if you could avoid snoring, that would help me. Um, I'm going to start by asking you uh, what metaphors do you use for organisations? Uh, just shout them out. Tribe. Sorry? Tribe. Tribe. Tribes. Tribes? Yeah, okay. What else we got? Society. Train crash. Train crash, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Network rail, we'll chat to you later. What, somebody here said something. Trees. Some trees. Okay, now that's somebody trying to be clever because they have seen another of my talk. Go on. Flux. Flux. Okay, I mean, I think you're cheating as well. <laughs> I shouldn't have spoken to people last night, should I? Okay, so this afternoon I'm going to talk a little bit about the research that I'm doing um, in the tiny fraction of the week that I spend studying. Um, I'm going to do some metaphysics. Who's a big fan of metaphysics? Come on, hands up. Oh, yeah. Oh, two of you. Great. Um, the rest of you, I'll try not to make it too obvious. We're going to talk a little bit about that. Now, this might sound like an obvious statement. The organisation is not a physical object. Well, obviously, the organisation isn't a physical object. Okay? If you ground down every atom in the universe, you would not find a single atom of organisationium. Okay? It doesn't exist. They don't exist. But the problem here is we very often use building metaphors when we're talking about organisations. So who has ever come up with a blueprint target operating model that they have then worked towards? Uh, there's a couple of very sheepish hands. Oh, yeah. Nobody's really putting their hands up. They're all sort of like, oh, God, yeah, I've done that. Um, so, yeah, metaphors are powerful, but they can influence our thinking in quite dangerous ways. And one of them is that basically all of our change management approaches are based on the idea that today we are in this state here, and tomorrow, magically, we will be in this state here, right? And what we don't talk about is the gap in between state one and state two. And if we do, we do a lot of things which don't really work or feel uncomfortable, okay? Now, this comes from a fundamental metaphysical assumption. There we go, I said I'd mention it, about the world which has worked for about two and a half thousand years. And it's great. So we have a bloke called Parmenides. Um, big up those who are fans of Parmenides. 500 B cell. Yeah. Do you actually know Parmenides? Okay, cool. So he says, all matter in the universe is stable and it doesn't change. Sorry? Well, I, I think you'll find that that change is unusual and that we don't need to pay attention to it. Okay? So here's the thing. We've got this myth of stability. And let's be honest, that's how we think about organisations. And the problem is, actually, organisations are a bit more like sandcastles when the tide's coming in. There is always something changing. It's what I've got written in big letters on my screen here is, change is utterly inherent. It says in organisations, in the entire universe, anybody here a quantum physicist? <laughs> Once was. Okay, so quantum physics is basically at the lowest level of the universe, we have lots of processes happening and unhappening all the time, right? Yeah? That's the universe. It's all processes. It's not substances. A process pops a couple of quarks into existence and they pop out of existence again. They come, they go. It's a process. The Big Bang itself is a process, or was a process. It's still ongoing. The Earth was a process. A process of accretion into a ball. Then they started having fights about the plates on the planet and it was like, well, do we make volcanoes or diamonds? Let's do both. The universe is made up of processes and they're constantly affecting the way our organisations are trying to evolve. And the biggest bit of change management that we do is arresting change. 
Okay? Who has ever put a process in place to ensure that something happens the correct way every single time? Anybody ever done processes, including my boss? Okay, that's good news. Okay? Why are we doing that? Well, because things change and we want to make sure they don't change. Okay? So our problem is what we do is we spend all of our time arresting change and then we say, oh, but we need to manage change. Make a choice. You can't have that both ways. You can't spend all of your time simultaneously changing and not changing. So this is a substantialist mindset. That sounds fancy. But it basically means you think of the universe as being substances. And that works really well in chemistry and physics and to an extent in organisations. It allows my computer to work fairly well because we think of things as substances and they work in certain ways. So instead of spending all of our time trying to shore up sandcastles, what should we do? Let me first of all just explain why this is a problem. Uh, now, I, I hope you'll be impressed by this uh, level of art. I've put my all into it and I expect a round of applause, okay? Thank you. Thank you, clip art. Um, who's heard of Zeno? Zeno, yeah, okay. He was about 500 BC-ish as well. And he came just after Parmenides and he said, well, here's the proof that things can't change. Okay? And so he said, he said lots of, there were four of these that we know about. Here's one that I'm going to talk about today. Uh, he said, here's an arrow. If you fire an arrow, it goes in an arc. Can everybody see that arc, more or less? Yeah, okay. And if, if an archer fires the arrow, it moves through the, like, I, where's that round of applause? <laughs> Thank you. Okay. But the problem is, what we actually do is we see this as a series of time slices. Okay. We have point A, point B, point C. If the arrow is at point one at time one, and occupies the exact dimensions of an arrow. And then at time two is at point B and still occupies the same time and space. When did the arrow move? Ooh. Now, like anybody who's done advanced maths will say, hey, you can solve that with calculus. Okay, they didn't have calculus 2,500 years ago, okay? And they absolutely took this at proof as proof that change was impossible. Kind of ignores the fact that the arrow literally th flew through the air. I will say later on, Plato came along and he said, actually, no, it's a bit of both, okay? So Plato kind of fudges it a bit and, you know, that's kind of where we are today. However... Another last philosopher, I promise. Heraclitus, also about 500 BC when they were fighting about all the really basic stuff. He said, you can't step twice into the same river. You've all heard that saying, right? Because both you have changed and the river is constantly flowing and its boundaries are changing. That river is a process. And that river is always in a state of becoming something new. Like, will it become an oxbow lake? I haven't done geography for several years. I hope I've got that right. The water flows down constantly. It goes into the sea and then it goes back up into the sky and so on. So there's a bunch of philosophers. Um, okay, I did say that, that was going to be my last philosopher. I'm going to name drop some others, but I'm not going to really talk about them. Uh, starts with a guy called Whitehead and Bergson in the early, well, late 19th and early 20th century. And they say, what if we look at the world as being made up of processes rather than as of substances? And there's sort of two views there. There's the weak view and the strong view. The weak view says... It's processes, but actually we can talk about real physical objects. And then there's the really hard processes who say, no, no, it's processes all the way down. No turtles, just, just processes. So if we're focusing on processes, then processes, by definition, are always in a state of change. They are constantly fluctuating. There's always something new happening. 
Processes are created by other processes. Okay? Now, at the risk of uh, ruining some of your naivety or innocence, that's where we get babies from. There is a process, right? Takes about nine months, for those of you who didn't know. Takes about 30 seconds to start. Goes on for nine months. There's a new life. During that nine months, does the baby exist? Of course, that's a big question I am not going to attempt to answer right now. Don't want to start World War Three, But we can at least say that that is a contested concept. Okay, so we have a process of genesis of new processes. And then there's the period at the end where death happens. And of course, even when we die, we still exist. At what point do we stop existing? Like, I'm assuming my body will be buried in the ground or something, and presumably it will go on to feed worms that will go on to die and feed trees or whatever. At what point am I no longer part of that process? So it takes on a completely new perspective and it requires you to think in different ways. Let me just check. Oh yeah, I want to be clear, I'm not saying physical things don't exist by the way. I can still pick up a chair and hit somebody over the head, you will still feel it. And in fact, of course, the act of picking up a chair and hitting somebody over the head with it is a process. So it truly is processes all the way down, but the processes are what are giving rise to those material objects. Somebody dug the oil out of the ground, turned it into plastic, somebody dug up some ore, turned that into the metal tubing and created this object. So its processes. Okay, a serious slide with two columns, they're always good, aren't they? Not as fun as the videos, perhaps? So there are two mindsets here. We've got this substantialist mindset and we've got this processist mindset. The substantialist mindset is very much focused on things that are. Right? We use the word being to describe them. This chair is definitely here. This chair is not currently becoming anything else, although if I carry out my threats, it will become a weapon, of course. Okay. So in this, what we're doing is we're saying, actually, as processes, we're going to elevate activity over substance. We're going to look at what things are doing rather than what they're made of. We're looking at process over product. Yes, we can still be product oriented there, but actually what we're acknowledging is that the product is a function of the process of creation, of genesis, of maintenance. Yeah, was it? Oh, 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 oh. Okay, it was, it was his phone that really threw me. I didn't know what was going on. Change over persistence. Okay, this chair is unlikely to change state today. If it does, we're probably in as much trouble as the chair. Okay, we expect things to remain relatively static, but actually, the dynamics in this room are constantly changing, including by people playing videos whilst I'm talking. Right? That changed the situation. It changed what was going on. It was a good example. I'll pay you a tenner afterwards. We have novelty instead of continuity. This chair's not going to turn into something new. It's not going to turn into a table. You could use it as a table, but that's not the area of philosophy we're talking about today. So we are expecting, as processists, things will change and create new things. Because that's what happens when multiple processes come together. And that, of course, is what happens at events like this. You as individual processes, which and you yourselves are made up of multiple processes, of course, come in and interact in new and exciting ways. And you have conversations you've never had before. And you think things you've never thought before. And new concepts are born. Uh, what have I got here? Oh, yeah. A reminder that substances aren't denied. Some people, when I talk about this, think, does that mean you don't think that substances are real? They're real. I enjoy eating them. That's, that's good enough for me. So, will this work? Fire, by the way, is a process. It's not a substance. Fire is an ongoing process of the conversion of one thing into another thing. Requires oxygen, so we've got lots of processes coming together. So, 
My proposal is that actually processism is closer to the agile mindset than substantialism. We can't control processes. We can't arrest processes all the time. We can try. What we end up doing is pouring a lot of energy into halting things rather than enabling them to go in the direction that supports our goals and objectives. It also means that predicting is difficult, though. So if we focus on processes, then predicting what the outcome is going to be is hard. We all know that complex adaptive systems are inherently unpredictable. Um, just ask the Met Office, you know, three days for a reasonable prediction. That's because it's a complex system made up of a bunch of weather processes. So if static, sorry, substances are static unchanging, then we're spending all of our energy on holding it still and arresting it. But the change is already happening and we're fighting against it. So if we focus on processes, we avoid control issues and we enable adaptation to the things that are already in process. So how can we adjust our focus? Right? I mean, metaphysics is great and everything, but you're all kind of here as practitioners and you kind of want to take something away from this, I think. Um, so, here's four things that I think will help you better serve teams, uh, better serve yourself, better serve the community, perhaps better serve the organisations that you're working on bigger than the teams. And those are relationships, reiteration and novelty, plot, and potentiality versus actualisation. And this is fractal, right? So if you're focusing on things, things, it doesn't matter if you're focusing down at the very lowest layer of the organisation or at the very highest layer. These will benefit you in thinking about how these things are changing constantly. If anybody's familiar with um, viable systems model, levels three, four and five, basically. So let's go to this one. Processes are loosely coupled, although the word loosely here could be anywhere from very, very tightly coupled to actually very weakly coupled. There are lots of different relationships between members of teams, between teams themselves, between teams and customers, between organisations, so think partners, supply, distribution networks, people and technology, people and the paper processes that we all have to go through at work and not the processes that I'm talking about, uh, and people and resources. Okay? All of those are forms of relationship. And the sorts of questions we should be asking are, which of those relationships need strengthening in order to achieve our goals? Which of those relationships need to be weakened in some way or removed? Which relationships need to be created altogether? There isn't a relationship between team A and team B and we need them to start talking. How can we do that in a way which supports our objectives? Difference and novelty. What events, occurrences, processes happen all the time? So hopefully if you're working with developers, they check in code and it builds successfully all the time. Okay? Are there particular types of errors that are happening repeatedly? Okay? It's particular types of bugs that are creeping in, particular type of security vulnerabilities, quality problems. Is there natural variation in a process that involves actual apples, for example? Do you see things changing? Does your team have the requisite variety to deal with that variety that's coming in? Do you introduce some new skills in order to cope with that? What differences are there in the repetitions and what repetitions are there in the differences? Those are the questions we should be asking here. What do you want to continue doing and how can you rearrange the problem to focus on the things that are important? Next, stories. What stories are your customers telling? Open brackets about your product, close brackets. What needs do they have? What pressures and pain points do they have? What stories are suppliers telling you? 
Are there shortages, new products, innovations that are coming online? How can you capitalise on those in order to maximise your objectives? What stories are management telling the organisation? What stories are the teams telling about the stories that our management are telling the organisation? They are not the same stories. Listen to them because it tells you where the gap is and it tells you where you need to build new relationships. What political and economic stories are being told? And how are these stories being understood? And then there's the sense-making element. What stories are people telling each other in order to make sense of what's actually happening? I'm not necessarily talking about the Dave Snowden sense of the term there, although I don't necessarily exclude that either. What stories can you as a coach be telling to guide teams and to support them? Okay, so uh, just to move completely away from philosophy, this is some cool biology. Uh, this in the middle here, this is a slime mould, okay? And these white bits are oats. Does anybody know what this pattern is? This is quite an old video. You do know, right, okay. Don't spoil it for everybody around you, okay? So they are laid out in the pattern of Tokyo subway stations. Oh, I've got an R over there, that's cool. And so what the slime mould does, this is pretty cool, I think is it starts by just trying every possible route that it can do across the network, okay? It's sort of stretching itself out, and you can see it's starting to make connections between the oats, which represent the stations. And what happens is it strengthens those connections between the valuable sources of nutrients, and it weakens them where they don't exist. This took about two days, I think. Please correct me if I'm wrong, but not long. Um, calculating the most efficient route between every station is beyond our current technical capabilities, unless you've got quantum computers in your back pocket and you've not told us about it. Okay? What the slime mould is doing is, is exploring every possibility and then consciously choosing. I'm using the word consciously there. Do I think slime mould is intelligent? Well, it's more intelligent than me than calculating this, so yeah, I guess. And then it goes, here's the actuality I'm choosing for the most efficient connections. When you are looking at opportunities and potentialities, are you consciously choosing your direction of travel? Are you being conscious of the routes that you do not take? Okay? There's a whole thing about teams who go, well, we could do A or B. And like, they like A, so they never really look at B. And then later on, they find out that B probably was a better idea. Let's just check that. Yep, yeah, I've got everything on that slide. Wind, by the way, another process. I mean, obviously, you can capture the substance of wind, but you'll find it doesn't move around much in whatever you've captured it in. It is a process. Instead of focusing on the imagined organisation, focusing on the change is what enables us or allows us to enable the change that is naturally happening instead of trying to impose a new change on the system. And in fact, we will end our time, we will reduce the amount of time and energy that we're spending arresting change rather than enabling it. Coincidentally, I think this is where places like Lean Agile London come in, right? Here you get to focus on the relationships between you and ideas and concepts and methods and people, right? You have an opportunity to find out what's novel and to be reminded of the thing that you've forgotten from last year or a couple of years ago. And you're like, oh yeah, it's really good to be reminded of things that are important. Even if we haven't forgotten them, but it just reinforces them. It, I feel like I'm stealing from the opening session. It creates habits. Look at the plot. What plots are coming up? What messages are coming up in session after session after session? Which ones do you want to build on? Which ones do you fundamentally disagree with? Uh, don't disagree with this one. It's a good one. 
And are you using this as an opportunity to select between the potentials, between the opportunities, between the possibilities? And are you being conscious about the ones you're choosing not to turn into something actual? Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I give to you uh, process philosophy. I hope that wasn't too heavy on the metaphysics. I hope you enjoyed it, and I hope you find that useful. Thank you.